I'm Lewis, I'm from CSRO, and today I'm going to talk to you about a really controversial uh, material, uh, and it's a material that I'm very intimate with, it's uh, plastic. And I just want to ask the question at the beginning of my talk, are all plastics bad? So I want to start with this photo, which actually won the Underwater Photographer of the Year competition this year, and it's a true indictment of you know, the negative impacts that plastics have on the world's ecosystems. As humans, we actually dump six and a half million tons of plastic every single year into the ocean. Uh, so this is a massive problem, and maybe this is a philosophical question for Aaron, but you might be, uh, you might be tempted to ask, you know, shouldn't we all just be done with using plastics, you know, forever? Like, we tried it, it didn't work, now let's move on, you know? Um, and when you see such a powerful image like this one, yeah, there's some strong arguments, and when you really look at... Um, when you look at the lifetime of these kind of materials in the environment, you can see that some of these take you know, several hundred years to actually degrade. And now, if you think about the fact that we actually only invented plastics 100 years ago, it means that the majority of the plastics that we've ever dumped in the, in the ocean, they're still there. All right? So this is a massive, massive problem. And it's really good that a lot of attitudes are changing, both in the scientific community and also in society. Uh, and I think this is going to be a driver for how we think about plastics in the future. So why are humans so obsessed with plastics? Well, they're actually really, really useful materials. They're really cheap, but more to the fact that they are synthetic materials, and that means that we can control a lot of their properties very, very easily. Um, so they're terrible in the environment, right? They, they're killing all the turtles. You hear about this all the time. But they, in the clinic, very, very... Um, important materials, and they can actually provide uh, a lot of um, uh, advantages, and it's going to really improve um, patients' lives. So they form the hard and the soft components of prosthetics. Um, they can form coating materials on different implants, like this uh, knee implant, or form the implant themselves, like this plastic stent. Um, there's this whole field of tissue engineering, which you may have heard of. This is where you can basically try and grow um, like a, an organ, like a heart, let's say, in a Petri dish. But you can't just grow it in a Petri dish. You actually need a scaffold for those cells to come in and integrate. And this, uh, we can actually design plastics to become that scaffold to act so that we can actually start to grow, you know, different organs and different tissues to try and replace, um, you know, for damaged uh, patients. Ah really struggling with this. Uh, we can use plastics to improve our diagnostics of different, uh, different diseases. We can also use them in wound healing. Um, and many of you might be wearing contact lenses in the audiences now. You might not realize, but the first ever contact lenses are actually made of glass. So you can imagine how uncomfortable that would have been to wear. And I wouldn't have been wanting to play any sports, you know, with a glass contact lens, because imagine if that just cracked in your eye. Um, yeah, pretty gruesome. But obviously today we have extended wear at contact lenses and these are flexible plastic materials. Uh, something that I've got a real passion about is in the use of nano vehicles and I'll come on to speak about this uh, later but we can actually use plastics to deliver medicines to different uh, sites of our body. And not only delivering existing medicines, we can actually use plastics as medicines themselves. Um, so I've introduced the term polymer here what is a polymer, uh, and how does it relate to plastics? Well, all plastics are polymers, and polymers are basically long-chain molecules uh, which are just repeating units of the same, you know, just there's this one, there's this one, there's this one, just a chain of long, uh, of repeating units, which we call monomers. So we've got synthetic materials like polystyrene and uh, PVC. These are basically just the same molecule again and again. We also have copolymers, which is where you have uh, two or more different monomers blended together. So this is what you find in your tires and uh, in your plastic, um, plastic bottles. We also have natural polymers like starch, which many of you are eating tonight. Um, and yeah, starch is a polymer of glucose, right? So we don't think of starch as a plastic. It can be in sometimes. But uh, yeah, this is basically how we get our energy, by breaking down the polymer starch into the monomer glucose. So coming back onto our applications, these are just two that I'm going to focus on for the rest of the talk. Uh, and these come under the area of nanomedicine. So what is nanomedicine? Well, it's the marriage sorry, of nanotechnology, so engineering, but on a really tiny scale, 
and conventional medicine, okay? So we might be used to seeing these ambulances delivering medicines and delivering doctors to a patient's house. But imagine now we can actually shrink this ambulance right down into the nanoscale and use that ambulance to deliver the medicines directly to a disease site. So, of course, scientists aren't the first people to think of this. Uh, this has been thought about all the time in science fiction, long, long ago, and people have been thinking about more and more creative ways of getting uh, these materials to the different disease sites. Uh, so this is a, a massive holy grail for, for modern medicine. Um, but why is that? Why do we actually want to deliver just to a disease site? Whoop. So I'll refer you to chemotherapy. So when you think about cancer patients, of course, the first thing you think about is the hair loss. Uh, and this is actually coming from the chemotherapy, so the drugs that we're actually giving these cancer patients, not from the cancer itself. Uh, and it's not just hair loss, there's also a whole range of more serious uh, issues, and some of these can be fatal, and if not fatal, then, in, you know, incredibly, uh, incredible discomfort for these patients. And the reason for this is because all medicines have off-target effects. So in the case of chemotherapy, you're giving a toxic agent, essentially, to go in and kill those cancer cells, but they're also killing all of your healthy cells. Well, sorry, not all of your healthy cells, but there's, there's some off-target effects, which means, of it, well, sometimes. <laughs> no, but um, so you're coming in, you're killing you know, some of those healthy cells, and that's what's leading to the hair loss and the nausea and all of these things. So imagine now that we can cure cancer with no side effects, okay? We can actually undergo chemo. We don't lose the hair. We don't have nausea. We're totally fine, and we can cure cancer. Uh, so you can imagine that we're going to be able to uh, hit that cancer a lot more, um, you know, harshly, and so that's going to give us a much better survival rate for those patients. And this is the major goal of nanomedicine. So how do we actually make our little vehicles? We can't make them like uh, the magic school bus or, you know, those little sperm things that were in Family Guy. Um, we actually use polymer self-assembly, uh, and the way I'll introduce you to this is the fact that water and oil don't mix, right? Uh, and the reason for this is that oil is hydrophobic, so it hates being in the water, so it actually separates. And we can do this with polymers as well. So we can make polymers that really love water and polymers that really hate water. But what happens now if we actually stick those two things together and frustrate that molecule so that they can't get away from one another? And then what happens if we put that polymer in pure water? Well, I've made a little bit of a crappy animation. So what happens is, didn't really work. <laughs> so what happens is those chains come together, those hydrophobic um, components like to find each other, and then they sort of assemble themselves into a, a nanoparticle, and this hides the hydrophobic pocket. So we have a water-loving shell, so to the water it looks like it's a, hydrophobic a hydrophilic molecule, so it likes to be dissolved but it has also a hydrophobic core, and this is really important later. So how small can we make these particles? Oh, and uh, this is evidence that I don't pay for GIF-making software. Um, but if we shrink down from a human hair all the way down to a protein, we can sort of think about two different length scales. The micro scale, which is sort of things that you can kind of just about see, like like hairs all the way down to, to cells, and then the nanoscale, which you can't see, things like proteins. So our polymers actually sit here, so the single chain is between one and five nanometers, then you start to go up in size from a solid nanoparticle, and you can actually make these kind of uh, hollow sphere like uh, footballs, um, not like AFL, like proper football. Um, <laughs> sorry. Come on. So, okay, we can make kind of a range of different shapes. So what's the ultimate vehicle? Uh, I don't know anything about cars, but I would suggest that the best vehicle that's going to be able to travel somewhere is something that's going to be able to change in response to its environment. So I think the best vehicle is actually a transformer, right? Okay, you know, imagine you're coming along and you have to suddenly have to climb a wall. Of course, a transformer is going to be better than any car you can design. Right? And we can design our particles to really undergo shape transformations, and that's really important for nanomedicine. Um, 
So this is doxorubicin. This is an anti-cancer medicine. It's really, really not water-soluble, right? Which means we have to take a lot of it because it's not very available in our body. But when we blend it up with our polymers, it can actually sit inside that hydrophobic pocket that I was talking about, and this makes it a lot more available in the body. Now remember that this is kind of a half-water-loving, half-water-hating uh, polymer that's making up this particle. But we can design this so that when there's a stimuli uh, in, in the body, let's say, a change in acidity or a change in the temperature, we can actually go from being half-hydrophobic, half-hydrophilic, to being fully water-loving. And this means that our particle completely dissolves, and that's what releases the medicine. Okay, so we can actually design this system so that once it reaches the site of the disease, it dissolves and releases our medicine just where we want it, on-demand release. Um, so the, coming back to sort of cancer therapies, you know, we can design our system so that when the particle's in the presence of normal cells, which are typically cooler and less acidic, that particle remains intact and the medicine's not released. And this means that there's no side effects. But once it goes into the tumor environment, which is hotter and more acidic, the particle can dissolve and it means that the medicine's released and you're just getting that medicine to the tumor, not to anywhere else. Okay? So coming back to the sort of Greek mythology, this is a little bit like the Trojan horse. So the uh, tumor sees that friendly looking particle takes it up into the tumor, and then once inside the tumor, it dissolves, releases the medicine, or in this case, the, the Trojans, and that's what destroys the tumor. Um, during my PhD, I worked a little bit on uh, anti-leukemia agents, so these are cancers of the blood, um, and these are really serious uh, illnesses, I'm sure you can appreciate. The current therapy for these is actually to inject uh, proteins, functional proteins, into the blood. But the issue with these is that you have uh, a huge risk of allergic reaction. And actually, uh, this particular type of leukemia that I was working with was typically uh, found in um, uh, infants, so like one to five-year-olds. So they actually can't deal with this allergic reaction. It's fatal in a lot of cases. And the reason for this is, I mean, we eat proteins, right? So when you inject a protein, we can degrade it in our bodies. And so once you've degraded that protein drug, it's not effective anymore. So you have to have a high dose of that protein. And this is really bad because once you have a high dose of that protein, it means that it's easily recognized by our body. And this is what causes the allergic reaction to happen. So we use polymer self-assembly to wrap this uh, protein up inside a polymer capsule. And this blocked the degradation. So you needed a lower dose, but also blocked our body from being able to recognize it. And so it blocks the anaphylaxis, blocks the uh, allergic reaction. So if I want to liken this kind of particle to a, a vehicle, I'd say it was more like this tank, you know? It's giving it a lot of protection, but also camouflage from our body's immune system. Finally, I just want to talk about antibiotics. Uh, so this is the um, sort of what surgeons used to do back before antibiotics existed. So it's called bloodletting. And basically, you're just bleeding out the patient, trying to, trying to make sure that there's no um, bad germs, I guess, getting into the infection. Um, so put your hand, actually make some noise if you are under 47. Okay, those of you that were silent, uh, before antibiotics came along, the average life expectancy was 47. So I'm really glad that we invented antibiotics, but now we face a massive crisis because uh, we have antibiotics antimicrobial resistance now. This is actually on track to beat cancer as a leading cause of death. Uh, it's gonna kill 10 million people every single year once we get to 2050, if we don't find some new antibiotics. So this is a massive, massive issue. I can't believe that we're not talking about it more, but there we go. Um, so how do we actually um, solve the issue of uh, bacterial infections just naturally in our body? Well, we produce a small amount of these antimicrobial host defense peptides. Now, that's really complicated. Basically, these are very, very small proteins that can kill bacteria. And the way that they do that is they just rip holes in the bacterial membrane and bust them open, basically. So that's really great. But we've already learned today that proteins aren't very good drugs, right? So they're easily degraded. They're also very, very expensive to make. So some of the work that we're doing at CSIRO is to actually make 
polymers, plastic materials, that can mimic this structure of the antimicrobial peptides. And these can also bust holes in the bacteria. So this is giving us now a new hope, oh, sorry, a new hope in, uh, in the fight against antimicrobial resistance and these resistant infections. So I want to come back to my original question of whether all plastics are bad. And I hope that I've convinced you that whilst, yes, some are really catastrophic uh, for the environment, they have a range of different uses uh, in the biomedical field. I introduced uh, nanomedicine and how we can use uh, plastics to deliver drugs just to the site of, uh, of an illness. And how we can uh, tune these materials so that they can change shape in response to their environment. I spoke about how these uh, polymers could protect um, very sensitive drugs and how we can use plastics now to fight superbugs. Uh, it's not often that I get to talk at a public event like this, and I'm really, really excited that I've been able to. So I just want to um, give some shout outs to some really important people in my career. So my amazing mentors at CSIRO, Kath and Pete, as well as the whole team that's been working with me on this antimicrobial work, and this is not an extensive list. Um, I've had some really fantastic students working with me. Um, my PhD supervisors, Matt and Rachel, who are working with me on the anti-leukemia work, uh, as well as Chris the Rex and his team, and Spiros and uh, Chiara, who worked with me extensively on that project. Um, Charlotte Davidson out the back, um, just for like putting up with all my shit. Um, and also Nerd Night for putting on this fantastic event. I think this is an amazing uh, opportunity for people to come and share ideas, um, and you for hanging out. Thanks a lot. Go to nerdnight.com to find a Nerd Night event near you. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for our latest presentation.